turn, please, to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. And we shall read tonight from chapter 11, of course, but uh, starting a little bit further down the chapter, just to reassure ourselves that we have indeed made some progress. Acts chapter 11. Reading about Barnabas. And when Barnabas came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in those days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man, according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And I'm sure the Lord will add a blessing to the reading of his word here this evening. You may well have noticed, and some have commented on the fact, that the three keynote sessions so far have really gelled pretty well together. We have been giving out, if you like, challenges and warnings, and uh, some people even felt a little bit depressed after um, listening to all of that. But, of course, it comes, Paul was saying that, you know, he didn't uh, tell them what he was telling them, he didn't want to hurt them, he wanted to warn them, and he wanted to prepare them. And it just came into my mind that this being the last night of the year, um, that uh, the words of um, uh, Charles Dickens in his opening lines to the tale of two cities put it this way. And I just turn around the opposite way for the moment. The first line, he says, it was the worst of times and it was the best of times. And of course, when you continue on with that theme, the way he puts it, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We have everything before us and we have nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going the other way. And as I thought about that, I think that is true, and I would just like to put it to you this way. We are coming out of the worst and into the best of times. We are coming out of the times of foolishness, perhaps into times of wisdom. We are coming out of incredulity, into times of belief. We are coming out of darkness into light and out of despair into hope and then out of nothing and into everything. And these are perhaps things that we should also be saying to the people of God, that we are certainly not without hope. There are great opportunities before us in the years that lie ahead and perhaps in this next year particularly, if the Lord be not come. And I would just ask you to take away with you that first phrase, it was the worst of times, it was the best of times. And I want to try and encourage us tonight to look forward to better days and to better times, as perhaps described here in this uh, chapter that we have been reading together from Acts chapter 11. We saw what had happened at Antioch, that a number of people unknown, or as Paul would describe perhaps as unknown yet well known, these unknown people, they went to Antioch as refugees. 
When they arrived there, they preached the message of the gospel firstly to Jews and then subsequently to Gentiles. And, um, uh, and, uh, and as well as that, they saw great success in their ministry. And a church, a Gentile church, a Gentile-dominated church, if you like, was founded in the city of Antioch so long ago. We looked at, uh, briefly last night, its foundation in Antioch, and we also looked at the investigation by Jerusalem. And we saw that Barnabas came, and when he came and saw the, what had happened in Antioch, he recognized the grace of God working there and was glad. There was no jealousy in his heart. Here was a work that had started altogether apart from Jerusalem, and he saw it and was glad. And of course, he stayed with them, as we know, for some time. It is interesting that his exhortation to them was that they should cleave unto the Lord and maintain that personal relationship which we spoke about that is so important for the believer. However, when we started, where we're going to start this evening in this particular message is that we read in verse number 25, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. We might ask ourselves the question, why should he do that? Saul had been out of circulation for some years. Saul had been a Jew, indeed a Pharisee. And so why in a Gentile church go for a man who has been out of circulation for some years and who is in fact or was a Jew? But Barnabas recognized a couple of things here, I think. First of all, with the growth of the church, I think that Barnabas recognized his own inability to continue to pastor, to teach, and to look after this church, and realized that he needed help. And I think in the servants of God, that is a good thing, that they recognize their own inability. And I have to say to you that it is my experience that the older that I get, the more unable I feel. I could have addressed a meeting like this at some of the earlier Rise Up conferences, which were also much bigger, in the boldness of uh, perhaps middle age. But now when I'm here, uh, I, I, I these days feel more nervous in presenting the Word of God to God's people. I realize a great sense of my own inability. Sometimes people say to me, I heard you preach years ago on Ephesians chapter 1, and they can tell me it was 30 years ago and what I said. And I think to myself, what do I know about Ephesians 1? Not much. Not even now, 30 years later. What did I know then? Well, it didn't hinder me preaching, apparently. And, um, uh, but you see what I mean? As you get older, you realize your own inability. When you're young, you think you can do it all. I think it is a good thing for each of us to be humble enough because we have much to be humble about as regards our own abilities and our own gifts. We very often need help and we should not be behind the door at seeking that help as Saul, as Barnabas did for Saul. So he didn't just write a note to Saul and say, we have some uh, vacant spots in some week in January and we would like you to come and have some meetings with us. He didn't do that. But what he did do was that he went to find Saul. He went all the way to Tarsus, quite a long journey, and he went there, found Saul, and presented the need of Antioch to Saul. And of course, we know that Saul came back with him, and he goes on to tell us what they did there. So I would say to you today, the reason that Barnabas invited Saul to come was that he realized that he himself could not do everything. He realized that the people of God needed doctrine taught to them. They needed encouragement. He could give them encouragement, but perhaps Saul was the best man to give them the teaching concerning the doctrine. And so he went and he sought Saul. And it is the responsibility of the elders of every church to seek to provide either from within their own number or from outside their own number, those who are able and willing to teach the Word of God in an acceptable way to the people of God so that they will understand it and be built up in their most holy faith. 
And so we read that Saul came and um, uh, he must also have recognized the need, saw the great challenge of the day, and we read that in those days when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the people were called Christians, disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So Saul was there with Barnabas with the teaching ministry. The two of them were there, Barnabas, the encourager, Paul, the man with the doctrine. And so they preached there. Now look how they preached. They preached for a whole year. This was, for a whole year, a consistent, consecutive ministry, preached to those who had been Gentiles and were now believers, by a man who had been a Jew and understood his Old Testament like the back of his hand and could present to them compelling ministry. And I suppose he must have preached to them about the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe as foreseen in the Old Testament. And what a privilege it would have been to have been in those meetings, to be there for a whole year. And I want to say to you that it seems to me that the teaching of the Bible in a consistent and consecutive way to the people of God is something that we should do more of. Very often when people are invited to come for ministry, they choose their own subject and it could be totally different and away out of context with what the previous speaker had spoken about. Now there is a place for that, but there is also a place that the elders who arrange meetings should have in view a specific ideal, that they, a specific result that they want from those meetings. And I think that we preachers also uh, relish the idea that we are given a subject to speak to because it drives us to our knees and encourages us in the things of the Lord as well. Teaching needs teachers. Very often the assembly has got plenty of people in it who can give, as we would say back in the United Kingdom, a wee word. Now there's nothing wrong with a wee word in its right place. But as far as teaching is concerned, teaching needs teachers. And how good it is that amongst the gifts that God has given to his church is the gift of teaching. And so teachers need, teaching needs teachers. Furthermore than that, teaching takes time. For a whole year, they continued. We don't know whether it was once a week or once a day or a variety of those things. But for a whole year, consistently, time after time, they taught the people of God, the word of God, and the ways of God, and the expectations of God, and the responsibilities that the people had. And we know in other places where Paul was just a few weeks, really, uh, in a place like Thessalonica, the things that he taught them during that time. And therefore, we would anticipate that the things that he taught for a full year in Antioch were of great and tremendous blessing to the people of God there. This teaching was also associated directly with the church. And all Bible teaching, it seems to me, should be associated directly with the church. Many have been blessed by having Bible studies in their own homes, but that should be in fellowship with the assembly and not against the assembly. And so teaching needs teachers, teaching takes time, teaching, if you like, involve, has an involvement with the church, and of course, teaching also, um, uh, if you like, attracts people. For a whole year with the church, they taught much people. And there's no indication as to how many, but much people. It seems that there was no falling off, perhaps, as the days and months went by. But at the end of it, the people of God were as eager to hear the word of God as they had been at the beginning. And it seems to me that even in the darkest days, the people of God will always respond to the word of God with enthusiasm if the preacher goes out of his way to warm their hearts, to encourage them, to build them up in their most holy faith, to remind them of what they have been saved from and what they have been saved to and where they are going. This touches the hearts of God's people 
and it is a huge privilege for the Bible teacher to be able to touch the hearts of God's people and find responses coming from them in various ways. So they taught much people. Now, all of this, it seems, had some sort of an effect because we are told that the, at the end of verse number 26, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And what a thing that was, to be called Christians. Some people say it was a name that was given to them in sarcasm or as a joke. Others would say that it was perhaps something that they had earned. Because after listening to all this teaching, the local people of Antioch, who were pagan, they noticed in the lives and hearts of these people, particularly in their lives, that they were Christ-like. And they were called Christians first in Antioch. And I just wonder if the first thing that somebody would say about me in describing me, I mean somebody in the world, would they say, you know, he's a Christian. He's like Christ. The objective of all ministry is to produce a Christ-likeness in the lives of the people of God. And this conference will have succeeded in a big way if it reproduces in the lives of some a greater likeness to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, here's the ministry. There was a need for it. The need was met. Bringing a particularly gifted man to preach to the people of God, he gave his time to it. He gave a whole year to it. And in fellowship with the church, taught much people. And the end result was that these people became known as Christians in the pagan city of Antioch. But then there were other things going on as well at the same time. Verse number 27 says, And in these days there came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. An Old Testament prophet was primarily a man who foretold the word of God. It has been suggested that a New Testament prophet was a man who forth told the word of God as he received direction before the completion of Holy Scripture, as he received direction, perhaps direct from heaven itself. And so there was this prophet who came from Jerusalem called Agabus. We don't know very much about him, really. We don't know here whether he was invited or whether he came of his own volition. But he came to Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus. I like that phrase, and there stood up. That seems to me to be about conviction, and there stood up. What our assemblies need today, and have always needed today, is not so much just men in the assembly, but assembly men. Men and women who have a conviction as to why they are there. They know why they are there. They know that God has placed them there. And they have convictions about that, strong convictions. And of course, here we see that our friend Agabus, he also had convictions. But his ministry, in a way, was a bit strange because he stood up and he signified by the Spirit. I think the idea behind the word signified is that he made it clear, he made it plain by the Holy Spirit. What was it? Well, he told the people that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world. And then with the uh, writer Luke adds, which came to pass in the days <coughs> of Claudius Caesar. Now, this was a prophetic ministry. This was a prophetic ministry. And prophetic ministry has always been a great attraction to the people of God. And yet, you wonder about that because... If it's merely telling us about the future, how does that help us for today? Well, I have two things to say about that. The first is this, that a ministry that builds in to the people of God for, few, for the future is indeed a blessed ministry. Very often, Bible teachers go about the country, if you like, putting out fires. In other words, the problem has occurred and it needs to be dealt with, and we put out fires. Real 
ministry is a ministry, while it is important to put out the fire, real ministry, it seems to me, is a ministry before the event and building up the people of God so that when the event occurs, they will be ready. I think, of course, of another section in the Acts of the Apostles, where the Apostle Paul called together in Acts chapter 20, the elders at Ephesus. And you remember his words to them as they gathered around him and he spoke to them. And I will just read some of these words to you just now. This is what he said to them. He said in verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. Paul here was warning the elders of, elders of Ephesus, at Ephesus of difficult days to come and building into them solidity, strength, courage, so that when the doctrine was attacked, so that when persecution came, that these good people would be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand to the glory of God at whatever cost to themselves. I think it is a tremendous gift to be able to minister the word in a way that builds in for the future. And maybe it is the lack of such teaching over the last 30, 40 years that has brought us to some extent to where we are now. Who could have foreseen the decline in assembly numbers in uh, certainly in the United Kingdom, of which, which I know best, maybe here as well? But we must not be discouraged. God has visited this land. God has blessed this land, UK I speak of, and here as well. And now God seems primarily to be dealing with some other countries and some other lands. It's not that he's forgotten us, but he is dealing with other lands and bringing millions into the kingdom and into the church as a result of the preaching of the gospel. And how wonderful it is to hear of the gospel and its progress in places like China and India, where there are now nearly 3,000 assemblies. How wonderful to hear of these things. And how wonderful as well it is that we should endeavor to build into the assembly things that will strengthen the believers when the evil day comes. And as I've said, encourage them so that having done all, they might continue to stand. But there was another side to this ministry of Agabus. It was not only building in for the future, but indeed it had a very strange result. Because we read in verse 29, here were the disciples in the church, they listened to the ministry. That in coming days, a few years down the line perhaps, there would be throughout all the world a famine. Verse number 29, that was verse 28, verse number 29, then the disciples, every man or each individual man, according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. A strange thing about a prophetic ministry, which focuses on the future, is that it very often has unexpected and unanticipated present results. These people exercised now about a famine that was yet to come realized that the mother church in Jerusalem and the assemblies round about Judea were in poverty, many of them living in poverty, and therefore they did their best to help. I like to entitle this little part of the message, if you like. We talked about... Uh, um, the, the, the foundation of the church of, at, Exodus, uh, at Antioch, its investigation by Jerusalem. We've been thinking about its teaching 
in the Word of God and it's building up. And of course, it now has these, this result that as far as these people were concerned, it resulted in two things. Number one, they sent money. And number two, they sent men with the message of the gospel to fields abroad in places yet untouched by the gospel message. But the first result was that they sent money to the poor saints at Jerusalem. I just want to talk about that for a moment or two. I'm able to do so quite freely. I have not, I am not a full-time worker. I am dependent upon my own resources. I don't look to the Lord's people for anything. But so I can feel that I can say this quite quite clearly and without any um, thing personal at all or any embarrassment. It is important that believers, and particularly young believers, are taught that it is an important thing. It is a blessed thing. It is a happy thing to give of their own sustenance, of their own money, to the work of the Lord. Now, these people at Antioch were not rich. Remember, they, some of them had been refugees. Others were pagan Gentiles. I, I have no suggestion at all that these were wealthy people. Indeed, we are told later that some of these as new assemblies gave out of their poverty, almost giving what they didn't have, they gave out of their poverty to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And each man... Here we have every man, but I think it can equally as well be read each man, because this is a personal responsibility. And what is the personal responsibility? We are told that each man determined, took action, determined in their minds and in their hearts. Then the disciples, each man, according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. And then verse 30 is a beautiful verse because it says, which also they did. Sometimes we have great ideas, we have big ideas, and they never come to fruition. And yet here we have, which also they did. In Acts chapter 9, we have an example of a person doing that, an individual, um, Dorcas, do you remember? Dorcas was a woman of ideas. She lived in a seaport where there were many widows. So she found a niche for her ministry amongst the widows of Joppa. And she was well known for good works and alms deeds, which she did. You and I might be ideas people, but getting round to fulfilling the idea is a big difficulty. And it might be that we should make a New Year resolution for those ideas that we had of supporting the people of God and the Lord's work, that we should be able to get on with it and to do it. Of course, we have ministry on that from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He says, let each one of you, again, it's a personal thing, on the first day of the week, he said, on the first day of the week, the giving of our substance and our money for the Lord and his work should be a regular thing. Paul said, I don't really want any special gatherings when I come to some places. This is something you should be doing regularly on the first day of the week. Do it regularly. Let every one of you individually lay by him in store thoughtfully as the Lord has prospered him proportionately. In other words, if I have a good week or a good month, then the Lord deserves more. We're not going to talk about tonight what the percentage should be. What you give is no business of mine, and what I might give is happily no business of yours either. But it is the business of myself before the Lord, so that I might be able to give in that particular way. You might say, well, it's all right for you. You've got plenty of money, therefore it's easy to give. You know, if you support the Lord's, the Lord's people, there are two number of ways of doing it. Number one, you do have a responsibility as a believer to contribute to your own assembly funds. The running of a church building, 
the organization of an assembly. It just doesn't happen for free. There are bills to be paid and so on, and it is the responsibility of everyone who attends the assembly to contribute towards that cost because you're using the facilities and therefore you have a responsibility to help towards that cost. I might also want to support some of the Lord's workers, either full-time, full -time, either in my home country or abroad. I might want to do that by sending something regularly to missionary organizations or others who will arrange such gifts for such gifts to be forwarded. And I think it's important for all of us to be involved in that ministry in addition to what we give to the assembly. You say, but when I give to the assembly and when I pay my, way, my own way and so on, I've got nothing left. But these people, out of what they hadn't got, they gave. Out of what they thought they hadn't got, they gave. Because one thing about giving to the Lord is, we often say the Lord is no man's debtor. And if you give to the Lord, you will be surprised how he meets your needs. Of course, that's not the reason for giving in the first place, but that is a consequence of giving. And the Lord, of course, as you know, is very interested in people fulfilling their responsibility. Do you remember the lady who cast in all that she had, two mites? If you like, those who saw her casting in the money, they counted it as it was put in, and it was what she put in that was important to them. What seemed to be important to the Lord was what she had left, and I have to say this, that as far as the ministry of precious seed is concerned, we are greatly dependent, indeed entirely dependent, upon support by the Lord's people, as are other magazines represented here today. And I discover this, that very often those who give most, apart from the corporate gifts from assemblies, those who give most are the women folk. And very often those who give most are the widows. Now this does not go unnoticed. The Lord notices such things and the Lord therefore in turn provides for those who would endeavor to provide for him. You might say, but I can't give very much. When I was for some years in an assembly I was in, I was the treasurer and I very often sent on a regular basis to missionaries abroad, um, some in those days fairly good sums of money. And we always got a nice letter back saying, thank you very much, that's good. And I would just say to full-time workers here, and I'm sure you do, but some don't, if somebody, a person, an individual, or an assembly send you a monetary gift, you should respond to that immediately. Sometimes at home we have had to chase up people to discover whether they actually got the gift or not. Now that's, that's too bad. It shouldn't, that shouldn't happen. But very often when I was doing that, I also at the same time encouraged our five children to put together a few pence, or as you might say, dollars, to send to another missionary at the same time. Not very much at all. And you know, the letters that we used to get back, the ones that were the most effusive and the most grateful, if you like, were for the small gifts that came from those who really had nothing. And that was a great delight to my heart. It is important, it is important for you, it is important for me to use the money that the Lord has given to us for the support of his work and give it a prior position. Giving the money at the right place at the right time to the right person at the right time is very important. When I was an apprentice initially in the printing industry, we used in those days hot metal type which was very often set up from a case of type into the compositor's stick. When the job was printed, the type had to go back into the boxes in the case. And it was absolutely important to put the right letter in the right box. No point having an E among all the C's. That would only cause confusion. And the name, interestingly, the name given to that exercise of putting the letters back in the correct boxes was called distribution. And it seems to me that that describes fairly adequately the distribution to the saints, giving the right gift at the right time to the right person. 
I remember my mother telling a story. This is years ago, of course. She's been with the Lord for a long time. But um, I remember her telling of a preacher who visited an assembly in Belfast in Northern Ireland where we went. Somebody in the assembly had an exercise in those days to give him what we called half a crown, which uh, wasn't very much. It was, uh, I don't know, it wouldn't even be a dollar, but um, um, this person had an exercise to give it to the preacher. But as she was going out, as, as, he, was, or, uh, as he was going out to meet the preacher, to give him the money, he spotted an old lady from the assembly. And uh, he thought, you know, she probably needs the money more. And so he spoke to her and gave her the half crown. Later on, he was talking to the preacher and uh, he referred to this lady as dear old, poor old Mrs. So-and-so. And the preacher said, is she poor? And this man said, oh yes, she's poor. He says, well, that's funny because yesterday she just gave me half a crown. <laughs> you see, this person who had the exercise if you like, he thought he knew better than the Lord did. The Lord had told him to give it to the preacher, and he didn't. He gave it to poor Mrs. So-and-so, who gave it to the preacher. And what a blessing that was. How wonderful. And it's also important, as I say this, just to understand, too, that it is the responsibility of the preacher to accept the gift that is given to him without complaint. It may not be enough. It may be too much, but it doesn't matter. It's the result of the exercise of the assembly. I've told some of you this story before, but the first time I went to preach in the Bahamas, I um, was surprised to discover that there was sent to me a gift in the post for my expenses. And for the expense of my wife coming with me, um, by plane from the UK. So my wife and I looked at this check and she said, you can't accept that. She said, maybe it's all right for you to accept your part, but not for me to accept mine. I couldn't do that. I wasn't very happy about sending it back, so we devised a plan, which would be that we would change this money into US dollars. And when we were at the Bahamas, what we would do is we would put the US dollars in the collection as the, as the bag or the basket went round. And so on that day we arrived there and uh, the next day was the Sunday and the fellowship meeting. And when it came time for the collection, uh, we put our dollars into the basket. We hadn't even thought that when they received it they'd wonder where all this had come from, but that didn't concern us. So we put it in. After the morning meeting, the correspondent got up to give the announcements. He welcomed us. He said that the last week the collection had gone to brother so-and-so and, -so and um, he was sure he would be blessed by that and that the collection today was for the visiting preacher. <laughs> so, the Lord often exercises, exercises individuals to support his work in one way or another. And if the Lord exercises you to do that, no matter how much or how little, then do it. But don't try to fix it. Because if you fix it, then of course you will discover that maybe somebody else will get the blessing, like poor old Mrs. So-and-so. I think in that scenario, the blessing was hers rather than the person who had the first exercise. And so I repeat that it is important for us to give money to the Lord's work. And it is only as we send money to needy saints, to missionaries, to home workers, whether large or small, it is only as we do that and have done that, that eventually we can move on to the thought of sending men and sending women to the work of the Lord. That's what this assembly at Antioch did. It had an interest in missions, in projects of one kind or another, and they sent money to poor saints in Judea. And then we shall look at, God willing, on our final message on Thursday morning, 
as to how they sent men to the uttermost part of the earth. Of course, you and I now come today to the end of another year. And this year for many has been a difficult year, financially, employment-wise maybe, with many great difficulties. Many have, during this year, lost loved ones. They've gone through times of sorrow and times of sickness themselves. But as I've tried to raise your hopes for the future, let us remember that in 2014, it could be the best year ever for believers because the Lord might come. And what a day that would be. Furthermore, it might be that during those days, these days that we now face of 2014, let us, as the Apostle Paul said, stretch out to that which is before. And if the Lord in this conference has laid something upon your heart, you determine, like these good people in Antioch, that you'll do it. Has he called you to support his work? Has he called you to be a worker? Has he called you to be a prayer partner in someone else's work? If he has called, you respond, determined to do it, and God would bless you for that. As I say, we don't know what 2014 will bring, but I thought I would just end with this. You will remember, well, you may not remember, I only remember it as a little child, World War II, 1939 to 1945. The only things I remember about it are one night wakening, wakening up in my pushchair. I was only about four or five years of age. And my parents had been away hiding in the woods just outside Belfast because of the bombs dropping around our streets. And I remember one night wakening up and wondering what was going on on the way back from the woods back home. I remember one other time wakening up in an air raid shelter in the middle of a bombing raid. Those were dark days for the United Kingdom and for some parts of the empire. At Christmas on the 25th of December, 1939, King George VI broadcast to the British Empire, dressed in the uniform of the Admiral of the Fleet, sitting in front of two microphones at Sandringham. He spoke live to offer a message of reassurance and hope to his people. He said, a new year is at hand. We cannot tell what it will bring. If it brings peace, how thankful we all shall be. If it brings us continued struggle, we shall remain undaunted and committed. And so shall we. Furthermore, he quoted a piece of poetry by a Bristol lady called Minnie Louise Haskins. And the verse of poetry that he, that he quoted on that occasion was this. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he said to me, Put your hand in the hand of God, and that shall be to you better than a light and safer than a known way. And as we bid farewell to 2013 with all its problems, and as we face a new year, not knowing what it shall bring, I say to you, put your hand in the hand of God and that shall be better to you than a light and safer than a known way. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank thee in the name of the Lord Jesus for allowing us to be here. We thank thee for bringing us to this place that we might share thy word, be challenged by it, and respond to it. Our Father, we thank thee for thy blessings upon us as individuals and as assemblies during the year that has passed. We thank thee for all in Assembly Fellowship who during this past year have been converted, perhaps been baptized, and come into the fellowship. 
We thank thee for bringing many of thy people through days of darkness and sorrow and pain. And our Father, we bless thee at the end of this year for all thy goodness to us. We would say Maranatha. Our Father, we bless thee for these things. And as today, later today, we face a new year. We pray that thou wouldst give us grace in it to live for thee, to be able to stand up in the strength and dignity of the Lord, to face whatever problems it might bring. And we pray that we might have the opportunity to be involved in success in the work of the Lord and that 2014 might perhaps be one of the best years for the gospel and for the assemblies in the Western world. And we pray that thou wouldst continue to continue to work in other countries around the world where many thousands are coming to Christ. We would not forget also thine earthly people, and we pray for them, that thou wouldst bless them, that they might come, many of them might come, to see that the Messiah that they rejected is indeed King of kings and Lord of lords. We commit ourselves now and one another to thee, asking thy blessing upon us in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.